white appears that I'm gonna brainwash me. This gallery is in itself a work of art. I'm surprised at how many people have a car, they won't let their wives drive it. I sort of realize that there aren't any people of color in those departments. Women in Australia retire with 35% less super than men. And we're sick of it. The system was never built for us, so Verve Super was. Verve was founded by women to support women to build wealth and invest in a better world, while we all work together for change. Because super is power, and women deserve more of both. Verve, proud partner of All About Women 2021. Where are me? Well, I'm a Bemai. Juba Gali. Nora Gadigu Mujun. Gurgal Weary Gagala Gui. Yaguna Bariala Benga Bujari Gunyalu Yalum. The Sydney Opera House acknowledges the lands of the Gadigal. And we welcome you to Juba Gali, now known as Benelong Point. The Sydney Opera House honours our First Nations by fostering a shared sense of belonging for all Australians. And we pay our deep respects to the Gadigal people, traditional custodians of Jubagali. Welcome to the Sydney Opera House and enjoy the show. Hello. Good morning, and welcome to All About Women. My name's Edwina Throsby, and I'm the head of Talks and Ideas at the Sydney Opera House here, and the director of the festival. And um, I'd like to welcome you all, as well as everybody joining us on the live stream and at satellite events around the country. I can't think of a more important place to be after the couple of weeks we've had. Let's be honest, it's not been a great time for Australian women. I'm guessing that you, like me, and like all of us, have not had an awesome time reading the news over the last couple of weeks. From our parliament to our schools, our defence forces and our legal system, what has been demonstrated is how entirely inadequate our institutions are at dealing with issues of violence against women. And if we were in any doubt at all, what the last couple of weeks has shown us beyond doubt is that the boys club is alive and well and still in control. So, what a good time to get a bunch of feminists together in the one place. <laughs> it just feels so important today to have these sorts of conversations, to plot the revolution, and also just to be able to look around and think, look at these strong, wonderful feminists. If anyone can sort this shit out, it's us. <laughs> When I programmed this session today, I knew that it was going to be interesting and confronting and important, 
But I had no idea how timely and relevant this discussion would be because I think that today's conversation will help us put in context the sorts of behaviours and attitudes that we've been witnessing in Australian public life in the last couple of weeks. The assumptions of power, the absolute unthinking sexism, the entitlement, the righteous indignation when challenged, and the resistance to change and reform. These are all things that are embedded in centuries-old systems and structures of patriarchal power. So, cheery conversation, yeah? <laughs> Laura Bates is the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project and the author of several feminist books, the most recent of which is called Men Who Hate Women, which explores extreme misogyny and its real-life effects. Laura is joining us today from her home in London, and if you could please make her feel very welcome. We wish she was in the room, but welcome, Laura Bates. <laughs> Laura, next time I promise we'll fly you down so you can be sitting on stage with me. That would be much nicer. But I hope that you are <laughs> having a good, a good evening there in London, a good, a good Saturday night in. <laughs> Um, Laura, I am, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for having me. Laurie, you started the Everyday Sexism Project back in 2012. That's almost 20 years ago, before Me Too made the kind of tradition of female voices coming together, you know, something that was, that was revealed as, as sort of powerful and, and, and actually changing. What, can you tell us a bit about the Everyday Sexism Project, why you started it and what you wanted to do? Well, of course, in many ways, it was just the latest iteration of uh, feminist consciousness raising groups that had been going for such a long time. Um, the initial Me Too movement project had started before the Everyday Sexism project. Before that, there were the 1970s uh, feminist consciousness raising circles. And really, I think I was setting out to do what so many other feminists had wanted to do before, which was to force people to confront the reality of systemic gender inequality. Um, I recognised in 2012 that we were living in a world where women and girls were experiencing sexism, harassment, discrimination, sexual violence in a way that was disrupting and affecting their lives on a daily basis. But the public perception was that the problem simply no longer existed. I didn't think that I could fix the problem overnight, but I was so frustrated that we couldn't begin to solve it if people wouldn't acknowledge its existence. And I hoped that a a sort of consciousness raising project online in the, in the digital age would enable us to collect enough testimonies at one place to force people to recognize the reality and the scale of the problem and its systemic nature. But I wasn't really prepared for the, the way in which the project would take off. I thought that perhaps 50 or 60 people might share their stories and I thought that would be a really positive step forward. But instead, hundreds of thousands of stories poured in from women all over the world, including women in Australia. Um, and, and so it became the biggest uh, global data set of its kind that had ever been collected. And that was important in terms of then moving forward and looking at what some of the solutions might be as well. And these stories that came in sort of ranged from, you know, being wolf whistled in the street through to, you know, having your boss sexually harass you to, I mean, it was, it was that kind of, you know, as you say, everyday kind of experience that probably everybody, every woman in this audience mm -hmm. can relate to. The interesting thing I remember at the time is that it attracted some criticism because it was, um, it was sort of criticised for being like uh, too trivial and, and you know, what we needed to do more was to sort of focus at the big issues and these little issues were just really, you know, not to be worried about. But in fact, your experience when you gained notoriety, um, you know, in the media and online as the founder of this project actually showed how untrue that trivialisation of those experiences was because you started being trolled to a really, really extraordinary extent. Can you tell us about that? Well, it was ironic because um, within a few weeks of this project starting and um, some pretty uh, strident defences that it was completely unnecessary because there was no such thing as sexism anymore, I was receiving, on a bad day, 200 rape and death threats from men very explicitly describing the seven different weapons they'd used to disembowel me with and what order they would use them in. And that's something that's continued for the past nine years. Um, so, you know, when you're, you, you'll receive an email from a man that says, there's no such thing as sexism, you stupid bitch. Um, it, it's a fairly self-fulfilling um, prophecy on their part. But 
it was really important for me to to be bold about including all those different forms of discrimination and inequality because it hadn't really been done before. And as you say, there was this argument that I was conflating trivial things with, with serious abuse. But my argument was and remains that we had to look at the spectrum. We had to recognise, which isn't to say drawing simple lines of causation or saying that all of these things are on a par and should be treated in the same way. But if we can't even talk about something like street harassment, then what we're really talking about is a normalised power imbalance in our society that we are simply forced to accept. And how can you begin to address something like domestic abuse or sexual violence, crimes of power and control, without being allowed to address the ways in which those normalised attitudes and behaviours towards women flourish in a society to such an extent that the power imbalance is set up in the first place? So I always felt that was very important, that this was about joining the dots. It was about making connections between those normalised attitudes and the knock-on impact on women in, in other spheres. So... When you were receiving these kinds of messages from hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of men, that actually led you into the sort of beginning of the seeds for your latest book, Men Who Hate Women. Um, what was it that made you realise that Men Who Hate Women was an important book to write? Well, the interesting thing is that I think as a, um, as a woman online with an opinion, as a woman in politics, um, as a feminist woman, you will be aware, and I'm sure many women in our audience will be aware of these communities of men. But of course, I didn't write the book for nine years. And the reason why was because although I began to investigate these men, because it was a complete shock, and who were these people sending me these things? And I started to build an awareness of this sort of murky online world that they inhabited. There was at the time a, a very powerful um, and often repeated argument, a sort of version of don't feed the trolls, which was that we shouldn't give these communities the oxygen of publicity. And at the time, I was sympathetic to that argument. So although I was extremely aware of these communities. I was in touch with them on a daily basis, hundreds of them. I didn't talk about this for the best part of a decade. What I did do was start going into schools and working with young people, partly because so many of our entries to the Everyday Sexism Project were from girls, school girls talking about experiences of sexual violence and abuse but partly because it seemed to me pragmatic. It seemed that the most obvious way to try and tackle the problem was to start somewhere where we could get everybody in a room before the point at which these attitudes became ingrained and the obvious place to do that was at school. So for about eight years, I went into around two schools a week on average, working with hundreds and thousands of young people uh, from all different kinds of backgrounds all over the country and internationally. And of course, the responses were enormously varied. It wasn't always a walk in the park. Obviously, there was resistance and there were difficult conversations. But there was a marked and, and sinister shift in the last couple of years where suddenly I was experiencing a huge amount of resistance, of pushback, a very angry um, backlash from teenage boys. And they were coming pre-prepared. So they were arriving at talks believing that you were a hate-fueled feminazi who wanted to destroy men. They weren't able to listen or to engage whatsoever. And they had been indoctrinated with the same false statistics again and again. I would see in schools from uh, an inner city state school to a rural boarding school, I would hear the same false statistics about, for example, false rape allegations being extraordinarily common, or um, the same feminist conspiracy theories that there was a feminist conspiracy at the heart of our government seeking to destroy the lives of white men who were the real victims in our society. And as these boys started parroting these specific statistics, and as they started repeating to me the names of the male leading lights, if you like, of these online communities, suddenly it fell into place for me that these boys were being radicalised, that they were being groomed online by these communities extremely successfully and cleverly. And at that point, suddenly, the oxygen of publicity argument really kind of ceased to make sense because actually at that point, it seemed to me that it was quite useful for these communities that nobody knew who they were if they were managing to reach out and have such a huge impact on a generation of young men without any of the teachers or the parents or the governments in a position to support and prevent that from happening, having any idea who those communities were. 
which led you into what is known now as the Manosphere. Um, but before we go on, um, I'm sure that there are people in the audience who have questions for Laura as well. And uh, if you do want to ask questions, you can do so using an online, um, an online question asking platform that we have. So as you can see on the screen, you can uh, log in to www.slido, that's www.sli.do on your phone, put in the event code all about women and ask questions. Um, you can upvote questions that other people have asked that you would like to see asked on stage and they'll come to me um, on, on my tablet. So please do ask questions because I'm sure that a lot of you have had personal experience of this. It'd be great to hear from you. Um, so the Manosphere, Laura, is um, something that you became aware of when it became apparent to you that there was a language and um, a set of uh, statistics and arguing points that was common across um, all, of, all of these boys. What is the Manosphere? It's a, a loosely defined um, interconnected network, if you like, of a number of different uh, communities united really by a hatred of women. Um, but although they're closely connected and they have a kind of um, complex ecosystem, they are quite distinct communities within there. So they range from so-called incels or involuntary celibates, men who believe that they aren't having sex because women deny it, um, because they believe that they have an inherent entitlement to sex as men. Um, they believe that women should be punished for this denial um, of their sexual birthright, if you like, um, and they congregate and uh, swap tips and advice on raping women um, on a day of retribution when they dream of incels rising up and mass massacring and murdering young women who fail to sleep with them. Um, then there are uh, pickup artists. So the pickup artist industry globally is a $100 million industry that operates in almost every country in the world with absolutely no oversight, where in non-COVID times, in pretty much any major city in the world, a man can pay several thousand dollars on pretty much any given weekend to be trained in if essentially sexually harassing and, and at worst sexually assaulting women uh, by an industry whose leading likes are men who have themselves boasted about rape, um, who have advocated that rape should be legalised on public property. Um, and there is crossover in the belief systems of these different groups, but of course they have very different territory. Then you've got men going their own way. This is a group of men who believe women to be so toxic and dangerous and damaging that the only solution is to cut them out of your life altogether, um, which perhaps makes it sound rather niche or ridiculous. But in each of these cases, in each of the cases of the communities I'm describing, I've uncovered a, a complex network, a sort of ecosystem of blogs, websites, forums, communities, private uh, social media groups, vlogs, channels, chat rooms, forums, and, and each of these, we're talking about each individual sort of link in the chain, if you like, often having membership numbering in the tens or hundreds of thousands of members without taking into account the number of people who look at and consume this content without being a member. We're talking about a single one of these hundreds of websites having in the tens of millions of conversations and comments and chats going on. Then you've got men's rights activists, again, a, a distinct but connected group um, who claim to care about men and, and their needs and problems affecting men, but in fact to devote their time and energy exclusively to attacking and undermining women and feminism in particular, uh, bringing lawsuits, trying to defund frontline sexual violence services, that sort of thing. Um, and then you have trolls, um, a group which in some ways overlaps all of those, but in other ways is quite distinct. Um, so those are the kind of specific groups that I identified, and the book looks at the different mm. groups and at their overlaps with, with wider communities like white supremacists and the far right. So we'll, we'll, we'll have the um, you know, jaunty little, little trip through all of those groups uh, in a second, but, but when, you, when you started doing your investigation, you didn't go in and say, hello, I'm Laura Bates, I'm a feminist, and I am the author of, or the, the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, please do tell me about everything that you were doing online. Can you, um, can you tell us about your way of kind of investigating this, you know, the method that you used in order to, to get in? Yes, sorry, I lost you for a moment there, but I think I have you back now. Um, I, yes, I was very aware that these groups are extremely paranoid. 
Um, and I knew that there would be very little um, success um, by sort of going in immediately and as myself. So I created, um, I created a guy. I created a guy called Alex who um, I tried to make the kind of really typical representation of everything I was seeing in these communities. So he was a um, college-educated, rather disaffected white man in his early 20s, um, unlucky in love, and with a sense of discomfort at the conversations going on around him about privilege, um, about various different civil rights movement, about the idea that he felt that in order for women to advance, somebody wanted to take something away from him. And he started out on the fringes of this stuff. He doesn't go straight to an incel forum because nobody does. He started out watching um, funny memes on Instagram meme accounts. He started out watching viral YouTube clips of um, people having debates. And he started out on Facebook groups and gaming live streams and, and gradually sort of started picking up tidbits that led him to kind of quite generic websites where he started seeing slightly more in-depth messages Messages and ideas about men being the real victims and, and how unfair, actually, that men were the ones who seemed to be getting all of this stick when he hadn't done anything wrong personally and wasn't that really unfair? And why wasn't anybody thinking about how sexist it was to think that all men were like that, actually? And this was incredibly appealing because suddenly, instead of the position in society in which he saw himself as a bit of a loser, suddenly he wasn't a loser, he was an underdog. He wasn't unsuccessful, he was downtrodden. And here was this community of brothers in arms with experiences like his, ready to tell him that the whole world had been feeding him lies and that actually he was the poor downtrodden underdog and he was a hero and that they were brothers in arms on a crusade against a world stacked against them. And that was incredibly seductive because it provided him with this, this belonging, this sense of purpose and community that didn't necessarily exist for him elsewhere offline. And of course, it was very, very gradual. So at first, the misogyny was the odd joke or the odd meme. It was a, a meme about rape. It, you know, it was just a joke. It was just banter. It was men blowing off steam. And it was so gradual over time, the drip, 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 that the communities and the online circles he was moving in became more and more extreme in their misogyny. And somewhere along the way, they stopped being jokes. But by the point at which that happened, he'd heard so many of them that he didn't really notice them anymore. And, and that is very much the process that was described to me by the former members of these communities that I interviewed for the book, this very, very gradual sense of desensitization and, and a very gradual form of, of drip, drip, drip radicalization until you reach the point where you're seeing hundreds of messages come up faster than you can watch them coming in about whether or not one guy should go and rape his friend's teenage sister, about another guy offering to sell to the highest bidder a pair of underwear that he's stolen from a woman that he knows, another posting a photograph of an unconscious woman without her consent or knowledge as a what's known online in these circles as a lay report. And suddenly it's just so much and you're so suffused in it that it almost isn't shocking anymore. It shifts what normal is, right? Absolutely, it shifts that perception. And, and some of the people who've left these communities who I spoke to said, I can see it now. Now I'm out, looking back in, now I can see it. But I don't know how to explain to you that at the time, it just didn't feel that way. In fact, there was one member of these communities, one incel, who um, at one point spoke to the national press to try and defend his brothers in arms. So passionately did he feel that this was really a positive men's community and it was being maligned. And he was bombarded with hate and threats, which he'd anticipated but not from the place that he'd expected it to come from. He'd expected he it to come from feminists. with abuse and vitriol, of course. Mm. And instead, he was bombarded with abuse and vitriol from other men, from other incels, saying, why are you going out there saying that we don't mean it, saying that it's banter? We do want women to die. We do want to kill them. Stop telling the media that that's not what we're about. There's a question here from Lisa S, who wants to know, why do you think there was a kick-up in the manosphere a few years ago? What was the catalyst at that time? I'm wondering if it had something to do with me too. 
Well, I think that there's certainly been, uh, n perhaps not necessarily just a few years ago, I think a few years ago we started talking about it and becoming aware of it. So perhaps there was a kick up in, in publicity around it, although still very little relatively to other kind of hate movements. But I think perhaps over the last perhaps 10 or 15 years, there's been a, a pretty strong upward trajectory. And I think that you can um, trace that not necessarily to the emergence of fourth wave feminism, but perhaps to the media, renewed media focus on feminism, which I think is a more accurate way to describe it because feminism never went away but I think that as there was a perception in the public sphere that feminism was gaining ground part of it is a, a backlash against that but partly as well um, I, I don't know if this is the situation in Australia but certainly in the UK alongside that upward trajectory of the manosphere we've seen a massive downward trajectory in funding for youth centres for adolescent mental health services in particular for real life spaces where young men teenage boys can congregate and get that sense of community and purpose and brotherhood that is so seductive in the manosphere. So I think that not addressing those real life offline issues is another major driver, I think, of young men online. And I think this leads to another really important point in what we're talking about here, because, um, you know, when you talk about the manosphere, that does imply that it's entirely online and that all of this behaviour is only happening in a virtual world. But in fact, that is, you know, dreadfully and tragically not the case at all, because uh, this spills over into real life violence like a staggering amount of times. Absolutely. So in two ways, this is massively offline. The first is that men from these communities are carrying out offline crimes because of the radicalisation that's happened online. In the case of pickup artists, you've got women being raped who are then tracing their rapes back to pick up forums. In the case of incels um, and, and male supremacy, I've traced this to over 100 people who have been seriously injured or murdered in the last 10 years alone uh, by men explicitly acting in the name of these male supremacist, extremist, misogynistic ideologies. Um, but the other way in which it leaks offline is more subtle and perhaps more pervasive, which is that many of the ideologies and attitudes that belong to these shadowy communities so few people have ever even heard of are actually shockingly common and prevalent in our society, whether it's boys repeating them back to you at school, whether it's the fact that a huge number of politicians are aware of in conversation with and even shaping policy based on interaction with these individuals, or whether it's media interlocutors, so popular media figures who recognise the huge gains to be had by spouting dog whistle rhetoric that is essentially a kind of slightly purified version of, of these forms of ideology. So I, I would like to get to the politics and the media shortly, but, but in terms of the in real life violence, I mean, just to get a scale, a sense of the scale of this and the... And the can, you, can you talk about some of the sort of the numbers and, you know, we have Elliot Rogers, who obviously is the most famous incel mass murderer. But when I actually mm -hmm. did a sort of tally in, in your book, it was, you know, in excess of 100 victims in the last, what, decade or so. Yes, it is. And I think the fact that's really shocking here is that we may have heard of these attacks and not necessarily ever have known that they were terror attacks. We don't use that word to describe them as we would any other attack based on hatred of a specific demographic of people and intended to spread fear and in the name of an extremist ideology. So, yes, as you say, you've got Elliot Roger, the Santa Barbara massacre, he killed six people and injured 14 very explicitly in the name of hatred of women who wouldn't have sex with him. You've got George Sudini, who actually came before Elliot Roger in 2009, who entered a yoga class and, and shot nine women. You've got somebody like Alec Manassian, the Toronto van attacker, recently found guilty. He killed 10 people and injured 16, the vast majority of them women, again, explicitly telling police as soon as he was arrested that he was obsessed with Elliot Roger, that he had never been able to have a girlfriend, that he was furious with women and wanted to punish them for not having sex with him. Here in the UK, a teenager went on a two-month stabbing spree, attempted to murder three different women, sending police handwritten notes talking about the fact that women wouldn't have sex with him and he would punish them all. In Toronto, um, in the last couple of years, you've seen a teenage boy walk into a massage parlour with a machete and stab two women, killing one of them. Um, another even more recent event, again in, in Canada, where a man went into the parking lot of a superstore and stabbed a woman and her toddler daughter, all of these are incidents of men murdering, attacking, abusing women 
based explicitly on these extremist ideologies. And that's just to name a few. As I say, we're talking about over 100 victims. Mm. Um, the other way that it bleeds into the real world, in, I mean, you know, in countless ways, really, with, as you say, like, you know, exhort exhortations for other men to rape women, you know, and then men boasting about the women that they've raped in these forums and stuff. Um, but but the, the politics thing, I think, is super interesting because, again, it's really, it's really easy to regard these communities as, as sort of, you know, marginalised, you know, extreme, kind of off to the side. And, you know, let's, let's be clear because somebody's going to tweet at me about this. Not all men, hashtag not all men. Um, but, um, but there are, you know, as you say, hundreds of thousands of people in these communities, videos posted in these communities get viewed millions and millions and millions of times. But there are an awful lot of politicians who um, subscribe to this. So, you know, for example, men going their own way, you know, men who don't want to be, in a, you know, be alone with women. You know, you might scoff at that and, and say, but, I mean, Mike Pence, you know, not wanting to be in a room with a woman that wasn't his wife. And this, this stuff, you know, people in Davos last year all talking about how it was too dangerous for them now to meet with female colleagues alone. Can you talk about that fear of women that has, that has sort of spouted and kind of... I don't know, the, the, the manipulation involved in that? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So in terms of the political rhetoric, um, we think of these as extreme groups. We think of them as, as tiny groups with very little offline influence. But the reality, as you say, is that you've got men like Mike Pence literally living MGTOW, as they call themselves, men going their own way, MGTOW principles. Um, you've got 27% of American men in a recent survey saying that they now will refuse to have a one-to-one -one meeting with a woman in the workplace because of a fear of false allegations. So the ideology is actually incredibly common. Of course, President Trump was the biggest example of this, somebody throwing out very um, seemingly um, dog whistles to the ideology of these groups coming out and talking about the fact that it's a very uh, scary and dangerous time to be a young man in America, for example. Um, a lot of the things that he said was very much sort of um, sanitised versions of, of this form of rhetoric. But you also have politicians around the world who are meeting with members of these groups, and Australia is a particular area of concern for this, in fact, Hi, Pauline meeting Hanson. with members of these groups and then <laughs> and then adjusting policy accordingly. You've got politicians in Australia meeting with members of these groups who spout completely unsubstantiated and, and proven to be wildly factually inaccurate statistics and then repeating them to the national media, where, of course, coming out of the mouth of a politician, they then gain enor enormous credibility uh, to the point that 37% of Australians now believe that women lie about abuse in family courts, for example. So these ideas that begin as niche or online sort of extremism suddenly get through this sort of um, these interlocutors they're sort of smuggled offline if you like here in the UK we have an MP who regularly speaks at men's rights events who sits on our women and equalities committee so actually this is far more common than you might like to think there is um, a, a state representative a serving politician in the United States um, who was uh, the person behind and running one of the biggest um, of these extremist groups on, uh, on. Oh, Laura. All right, I'm just going to pick up while we're waiting for our tech team to um, to get back to get Laura back. I just want to pick up on the point that she made about Australian politics and um, and the family court because these movements actually have had a direct impact on the way that our family court is run. You know, we have legislation now in our family court, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, but we have legislation in our family court now which, uh, which privileges the, um, which has at its centre the right of a child to have access to both parents, which on the face of it is great and often is really good. But, um, but when a woman who's had an abusive partner or who knows that their partner has been abusing their children. If she testifies in family court that this has been happening, she's branded a hostile witness and it's more likely that the court is going to find against her and award custody of the children to the father than to her. And this, you know, this is, this is sort of a real problem that we're facing in Australia at the moment. Um, we're just trying to get Laura back right now, but um, 
but maybe this is an opportunity for a bit of audience Q&A. Um, there are some really, really good questions coming in, which when Laura comes back, I will be able to um, pass on to you. But there's, there's a really interesting um, sort of thread here about sort of engaging with men. And I think that that's, that's super important. But I also do think that, um, I know you didn't pay to hear me talk, but <laughs> um, I, I do think that there are issues around the way that these conversations are framed. So, you know, in the lead up to All About Women, every year we get huge amounts of correspondence from men and, and from, in, indeed, like, like people who identify as members of, of men's rights organisations and men's rights groups. And it's always like, you know, when's there going to be an All About Men festival? And how can you... And I mean, like, like, like constantly and many. And they cite the same sorts of statistics that Laura cites and they talk about the same kinds of... Um, the same kinds of issues that Laura talks about and, um, and all the sort of bullshit stuff that, that she's been talking about. And I think that there's this sort of... In engaging with men about this, men are incredibly important allies, and I think it's important to recognise that men are, and boys are just as oppressed by patriarchy as, as, as women are, and that masculinity is just as, as recessive. But sometimes also, it's not about you, mate. You know? Like, like it's kind of, you know, I know, I know it's not all men. Like, of, of course it's not all men. So I was talking about patriarchy. Was I talking about Peter? I wasn't, I wasn't talking about Peter. It was, so I think that it's really important to sort of not get lost in, you know, knowing our own voice and having our own voice in all of this um, when we're talking about this. Okay. Um, what do you all think? How's the week been for you? Has there been, you know, like, 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 as my sort of impression, as, as, as the anger that I've felt, is that shared by? Hello, hello. Has by, oh, Laura, you're back. I'm so sorry. Oh, not at all. I was about to start tap dancing, so it's really, really, really <laughs> lucky that you came back when you did. <laughs> so we were talking about, um, we were talking about the influence of the men's rights movement um, on. Uh, sort of mainstream politics in countries like Australia and the UK and the US and I'm sure other places. But I was really interested reading your book about the history of the men's rights movement. I hadn't actually been aware that it had actually started in the 1970s from a really well-intentioned place. Can you just tell us a bit about that history? Because I didn't know. Yeah, in many ways, this is one of the most heartbreaking parts of my research, I think. It is just, it's so tragic. So in the late 1960s and early 1970s, as uh, second wave feminism gained in, in momentum and, and prominence, um, there started a kind of nascent uh, men's movement, and it was called the Men's Liberation Movement, and it was a feminist men's movement. It was a movement that recognised the harm that, that men and that masculinity in its current societal iteration did to women, but also also wanted to examine the damage that it did to men. It wanted men to share their experiences. They had male consciousness raising and experience sharing workshops. And, and there's a beautiful interview with a member of the men's liberation movement in the 1971 issue of Life magazine. And he said, our enemy isn't women. It's the role we are forced to play. And you read that now and it sounds so radical and so exciting and fresh. And that was 50 years ago, um, which doesn't bode well for what happened to the movement in between, um, which is, is, is sort of heartbreaking. So there was a young man named Warren Farrell who became a kind of leading light of the movement. And he was so fated that there was a four page spread about him in People magazine. And he actually um, joined the, the organization, the National Organization for Women and was quite a prominent member. And, he was this very famous person who did these workshops where he tried to talk about sexism and women's experiences. And then at some point in the mid-1970s, Warren Farrell um, began to be concerned with what he perceived to be the particular discrimination faced by men. 
And at a certain point when the National Organisation for Women staked their um, position against the presumption of shared custody in divorce cases, he he split and a, a schism happened in the movement, essentially. And Warren Farrell and his followers began um, what were the seeds of the modern-day men's rights movement. And actually, the men's liberation movement, which kind of became a male anti-sexism movement, continued and continues to this day. And of course, there are brilliant male-led organisations tackling violence against women and, and looking at these kinds of issues to this day. I'm thinking of organisations like uh, Promundo, like the White Ribbon Campaign and so on. But of course, the men's rights movement gained much more momentum and uh, much greater following and um, around the world offshoots were set up and men's rights activists sort of continuing to follow uh, Warren Farrell um, and his book, The Myth of Male Power, which was published in the early 90s became a bit of a bible for the movement um, and that then kind of spawned what we now see as the online iteration of that with with major men's rights activist websites and and sort of leading figures who have um, hundreds of thousands of followers on youtube and social media and, and very big websites with a huge male following that spew lies about women and about feminism and so on one of the things that um, that really comes out strongly in your book and that really struck me was the links f between these communities and the conspiracy theorists and the white supremacists and mm -hmm. those kinds of, I mean, I'm guessing probably QAnon as well, I don't know, um, but, but those kinds of far-right, alt-right online groups, there's a huge amount, the Venn diagram between the, the, the manosphere and those groups has got quite a lot of crossover, doesn't it? It does, and it's so um, rarely recognised, and that's a real issue. I mean, it's not even really a Venn diagram, it's part of the same spider web. And if we don't recognise that, then we're losing a huge piece of the puzzle in tackling any one of those issues. So we can see enormous racism in the men's rights movement, in the in the manosphere, in all of these, these women-hating communities. These men are not just furious that women aren't having sex with them, they are particularly incensed if women choose to have sex with non-white men specifically and of course if you look at white supremacy if you look at the obsessions of that movement for example the idea of, of replacement theory obsession with birth rates these are men obsessed with the idea of, of of white male completely dominated society in which women are reduced to 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 rape slaves and forced to create these sort of legions of of white superior men black women are forcibly sterilized um are forced to have abortions. The idea that these two things aren't part of the same bigger picture is madness, really, and yet we very rarely see them being discussed in that way. Very often when we see white supremacist terror attacks or far-right things hitting the headlines, the misogyny is just kind of omitted from the story and, and vice versa when it comes to the racism inherent in, in incel groups. Um, but it's really important, not just from a kind of theoretical standpoint, but from a practical one, because these groups very deliberately and specifically see the manosphere as a kind of grooming ground for white supremacy. So what they believe is that it's easier to indoctrinate young men into hatred of women and anti-feminism specifically. And they then see this as a slip road into other forms of extremism. And they're very open about that. They talk about how to recruit boys. They specifically target boys at the age of 11 years old. They describe the use of pop culture, the use of memes and, and slick videos as adding cherry flavour to children's medicine. That's how they describe it. And they see it as a way to kind of bring them up in the ranks. And you can see that in the trajectory of many well-known white supremacists who made their name and found their feet, if you like, in, in anti-feminist manosphere movements like Gamergate. It's something that I didn't realise as well before I, before I read your book was, um, was the sort of evangelical nature of, of, of these groups, how they sort of actively recruited. I knew that they were there and I knew that they existed and I knew that they harassed women, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that they specifically and deliberately went after um, boys and young men. What's their goal? 
Well, ultimately, they want boots on the street. So whether you're talking about white supremacists who want to instigate a race war, a race riot, or whether you're talking about incels who, who want a day of retribution where women are slaughtered as revenge, we are literally talking about men who want to see these things happening offline. It, it, it's, it's not kind of euphemistic, it's real. Um, but of course, they also want to kind of subvert what they see as this feminist political conspiracy. So as far as they're concerned, the more people in the real world who are aware of the way that they see things, the better. And they, they explicitly talk about something called the Overton window, which they're obsessed with, which is that if rhetoric in the mainstream can shift far enough towards their side of the fence, then it makes their much more extremist ideology seem much more appealing and acceptable and normalised and therefore much easier to gain new recruits. So they cheer and celebrate when Donald Trump or somebody else in the public eye says something that appears to shift the rhetoric in that direction. And they're extremely clever and skillful at how they are radicalising boys. So they're not expecting boys to turn up on incel websites. They're going to where boys are. They are very big, for example, on gaming live streams. So where a boy might log into his Xbox or a gaming console or an online game and be playing with strangers around the world over his headset. And they will kind of drop out, it's sort of a little bit like fishing, they'll drop out little tiny bits of bait and see who bites. And then they'll move from there into an online gaming chat room, which is supposedly all about honing tactics. But actually, suddenly from there, you're taken to a pickup artistry website. And it's a, a kind of very, very clever process. They also find boys in places where they're likely to be vulnerable online. So one of the biggest surprises of the book really was uncovering a real hotbed of radicalization happening on bodybuilding websites, which at first glance appear to be quite separate until you look into the statistics and you suddenly realize that over 90% of the people on these bodybuilding websites in many cases are actually teens. And that of course, what you've got there is a pre-selected group of teenage boys who are obviously very anxious about appearing physically masculine. In other words, it's a ripe for the picking group of teenage boys for a group of men who are obsessed with these ideas about sort of traits of traditional masculinity. So they're very clever about how they do it. And they use tools that we just don't recognize as radicalization tools like YouTube, which I think for many adults we think of as the home of movie trailers and grumpy cat videos. But actually YouTube has 1.5 billion users, more than the number of households that own a television in the world. 90% of young people use the platform. It's where they get their news from. They're not getting it from anywhere else but from YouTube. Many of them say that they're online nine or 10 hours a day. And when you suddenly start to recognize the power that this machine has, 70% of the videos watched on YouTube are videos suggested by its algorithm. In other words, the YouTube algorithm is choosing more, the majority of what's watched on the site. And 37% of all mobile internet traffic internationally is accounted for by YouTube. So put those two statistics together and you realize that a quarter of all mobile internet traffic in the whole world is accounted for by YouTube and its algorithm, a private company, telling people what to watch. And at that point, it becomes very serious when you start looking into data that suggests that on YouTube, there is a huge influence and network of extremely powerful, far right and extremist misogynists. So you go to YouTube looking for something very simple, you type in something like what is feminism, and you start with a really simple video, something, you know, really sort of entry level, somebody talking about feminism and what it means. Within a few clicks, you've got influence influencers suddenly talking about how feminism is a lie and a conspiracy, people talking about how the gender pay gap is a myth, talking about how white men are the real victims of today's society, and only a few videos further on, all popping up automatically without you ever having to choose them, and suddenly you learn that women everywhere are lying about rape, that women are abusing their husbands in massive numbers and that there's a huge cover-up, and that's how quickly and easily it happens. So we have people recruiting online, we have explicit radicalization techniques. We have people literally killing people in the streets or in their places of work or education. Why don't we call it terrorism? 
Well, that is exactly the question. Only once in the whole world has it been described as terrorism officially, which is in the case of the incel machete killer in, in Canada, who I mentioned earlier. Um, I think the honest answer is that we are so desensitised to men killing women that we aren't able to perceive this as something as extreme as other forms of terrorism. Of course, there is massive Islamophobia, which means that we are already more likely to recognise certain forms of terrorism than others, we are slowly starting to recognise far right and white supremacist terrorism, but even that is a stretch. So when you realise that, that you're then going one step further than that to recognise misogynistic extremism, when misogynistic extremism, as everybody in Australia right now knows very well, is literally the wallpaper of our daily lives, it's no surprise that we don't see that as, as, as anything to raise an eyebrow to. You know, when one in three women on the planet will be raped or beaten in her lifetime, it's difficult for us to stop and recognise that a man going out and killing women because they're wi women is something Im emergency. It's enough of a, an extreme thing to, to have the word terrorism attached to it. And the consequences of that are massive because you've got US government accountability office reports that are literally looking at the government's response to terrorism and radicalisation, so really important tools. And there, over a kind of 15-year period, during which incel killers, it includes three major incel massacres, but on the list of all of the killers, they don't pop up. But in the same report, they are tracking and painstakingly tracing other forms of so-called extremism, like people with extreme views on the environment, or animal rights extremism, or people with extreme views on abortion, even though they say that in the period of the report, um, nobody was killed in the name of those forms of extremism. I rang up counter-terror organisations at government level when I was researching this book and Oh. Ask them about incels. I think you might have lost me. Have you no, lost no, 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 you, you're still here. We still have you. Oh, can you? Can you, can you still hear me? Yes. You can still hear me. Okay, I've lost the phone line, so I can't hear you, but I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, so, and hopefully they'll ring, patch me back through while I'm talking. So I spoke to people in these organisations, counter-terror organisations at government level, and I was asking them about various things, and then I used the word incel, and the line went dead. Um, and then they would come back and say, um, sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, and there'd be this kind of sense of papers quickly turning at the other end of the phone and they'd say, we'll have to ring you back. And a couple of weeks later, they'd ring back and say, um, we don't have any data about that, but we'd really like to talk to you about this other thing. So it, there really isn't any awareness um, amongst any bodies that have, um, I suppose, the power or the tools to be doing anything about it. And the same is true when it comes to, to teachers, um, to anti-radicalisation programmes based on, on schools and young people. Um, it just doesn't really appear. It, it barely gets a kind of footnote mention in the literature that's going out to teachers who are supposedly supposed to be supporting young people and helping to make sure that, that they're not falling prey to this kind of radicalisation, but they can't perform that function if they don't know that this particular form of radicalisation even exists. And yet the young people in their charge are absolutely aware of it and absolutely know about it. So there's this a huge disconnect there, I think. There are a lot of questions. Can you hear me um, still? I still can't hear you. Oh. I haven't been called back. So I'm going to ad-lib from my okay. end. It's all right with you, Just, just wait, I absolutely. Just talking. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk to you via our director, who I think you can hear. Um, sorry about this, guys, but we're just going to work, work, work shall around I, this. Shall I carry on talking? I mean, I'm very happy to carry on talking about the book if you can still hear me. Can you still hear me? <laughs> are you able to hear me, Edwina? You are? Are you happy for me to keep talking about, about the, these issues? Is that okay? I mean, it, it is if, if you can't hear the director, but I would like to ask you a question from the audience. Maddie, can you? I, I have nothing. I'm so sorry. Okay. okay, we'll keep talking. Oh, perhaps, I wonder if I can hear you with my other earphone. Hold on a second. Is that what you were saying? Put the other earphone in? Yes, that's yes. what I was saying. I'm oh, so fantastic. <laughs> Honestly, you guys, I owe you a drink. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we have a question from... Oh, we I'm have so a... sorry. <laughs> so we have a question from Lorna, uh, who asks, were you able to find ways to engage with or open up a dialogue with the radicalised boys you came across in schools? Um, yes. 
Absolutely, but it's difficult and it's time consuming and it really needs somebody more than me to be going in far more regularly than, than me turning up for one hour. Um, I find that the best way to tackle it is to undermine the assumptions about feminists that they've been set up to come in with. So just being prepared to sit down and listen to them and have a calm conversation with them is, is fairly shocking for them in the first place. I mean, literally some of the websites that I was researching in the course of the book have, have images of me on them with, with red eyes and devil horns photoshopped. So I think even the fact of me walking into that classroom and being a normal person um, and a reasonable person is, is quite shocking to them and, and, and in itself is a kind of start. I think the thing that's most important for me is that there is an answer to all of it. You know, none of these these extremist um, communities and the things that they say about feminism are actually the kind of gotcha um, moments that they think there are. There is literally an answer to a any of the myths that they've been been parroted. So when they come out and say, you know, the male mental health rate is shocking and the male suicide rate is three times higher than it is for women, so how can you bang on about feminism and women having problems? The answer to that is that all of the evidence that we have, all of the academic literature suggests that at the root of that male mental health crisis is the fact that we bring up kids in a world that tells them boys don't cry, men are tough and manly. And so by the point of university, we've got young male students who are three times less likely to have any kind of contact with counselling services. And of course, that's a gender stereotype. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. The other side of that coin is the idea that women are over-emotional and hormonal and, and can't stop going on about their feelings and you shouldn't hire them in science labs and politics. So it's all part of the same problem and it very much is about helping everybody and and you just I think talking about it in a way that acknowledges the issues that that they raise rather than what they expect you to do which is to dismiss them and just having that conversation and giving them the facts I think in some cases can help but I also think that once somebody has been really radicalized to kind of see you as a threat and as a suspicious figure who's coming in to undermine them it's very difficult to do that successfully and, and it works sometimes but what's far more effective is if we can stop it from happening in the first place which is why as I know many very courageous young women in Australia are calling for we have to start talking about this in schools from a much younger age. So going into families then how would um if you, if you, let's say you have a teenage son and he's spending an awful lot of time online and you can't possibly police that, are there any signs that you can be looking for that are warning signs that might be uh, an indication that, you know, some of the stuff he's talking about not, might not just be sort of teenage kind of stuff, might actually be displaying that there's something bigger going on or that, that there are links, links into the manosphere to him? Yes, absolutely. So the the most obvious thing that, that you can look out for is a sudden intolerance of other views, um, a sudden decision that, that not even a conversation is possible. That That's one sign of, of any kind of radicalisation. In terms of the manosphere in particular, there are buzzwords you can look out for, which are a pretty good sign. Um, red flag words, um, somebody talking about any kind of pill, red pill, black pill, blue pill. Um, somebody using terms like triggered, uh, butthurt, snowflake, normies, which is the word that these groups use to describe non-members of the community. Um, I always say that I think that it doesn't necessarily work to try and cut teenagers off from the internet or to introduce greater, tighter controls. What's much better is for adults in their lives to familiarise themselves with the reality of young people's online lives. You know, we're in a situation suddenly where a generation of non-digital natives is parenting and educating a generation of digital natives. That's never happened before and it will never happen again. But we don't often talk about what it takes to bridge that gap. And actually familiarising yourself with some of the reality of what they're seeing online is, is a good way to do it. And, and actually having at your fingertips some of the useful statistics just to debunk some of the stuff that they're hearing online because it, the debunking is there it's so easily done you know this idea that women everywhere are lying about rape a man is 230 times more likely to be raped himself in the UK than he is to be falsely accused of rape that's how stark the real statistics are so having some of those at your fingertips can be useful as well I think. We have a question from Kelsey who wants to know, have you experienced backlash from women and how do we engage with women who are anti-feminist? Um, 
to a very small degree, but absolutely nothing like the the kind of backlash and the vitriol from angry men. Um, I would say that, of course, those women exist. Um, I would say that they exist because we live in a society where adopting some of those attitudes, assimilation, if you like, um, is a coping mechanism. It's a, it's a survival response. Um, and that that's, I think, why those women behave and, and act in that way. So I think it's sleight of hand when society wants us to say, oh, women are their own worst enemies, to focus on queen bees who hold down other women, um, when the reality is that we're all working in a much bigger system. Um, I interviewed Gloria Steinem recently he was asked this question and she very beautifully and succinctly said women don't have the power to be each other's own worst enemies um, <laughs> and I think that was a very good way of putting it so look I mean we've all been a bit emotionally bruised here in this country over the last couple of weeks so I would like to try and end on a positive note when you go into schools presumably you're seeing young women as well as young men and you're probably seeing young men who are um, you know right behind this as well so what are, some of the, what are some of the things that you've seen or done that have actually made you feel hopeful that, that the future might be brighter? There are so many young women in this generation who are accused of being snowflakes and, and social justice warriors who are terrified of everything, who are so incredibly courageous and resilient and brave. Um, I was at one school where the girls had been aware on social media that the boys from the neighbouring boys' school who were joining them for my talk um, were venting about it and, and threatening to be incredibly disruptive in the talk. And these girls, instead of informing a teacher, decided to turn up a few minutes early at the auditorium and to space themselves out in every other seat throughout the entire hall so that when the boys arrived, they were forced to sit literally in between two girls, every one of them. And we ended up having a really productive conversation because they were forced to listen and I know that sounds like a very minor example but I think these things spread these things are contagious and it's about what we do in our own individual spheres that has a huge ripple effect and there was one woman who wrote to the everyday sexism project that she was um, abused shouted at very sexually explicitly by a man in the street and he was working on a roof and she said ordinarily she wouldn't have felt safe to respond but because he was up on the roof she shouted back for the first time ever and she shouted back you know how would you feel if I was commenting on your genitals as you walk down the street and he didn't take it very well um he started shouting worse abuse at her so she took down his ladder and walked away <laughs> and left him up there and um <laughs> And I told this story at a book festival I was speaking at and I got an email from the organiser of the festival about a week later saying, I thought you'd like to know that there was a group of women in your event who'd come together to hear, hear you speak. And on their way to the next event, a guy on a roof started shouting at them <laughs> and they took his ladder down and ran away. <laughs> um, and there were just... <laughs> There are a lot of those kinds of stories where people are finding very unique ways of, of saying, actually, we are not bloody putting up with this anymore. They're taking things into their own hands. And often it's those most ad hoc kind of in the moment things that give me the most hope. There was a man who wrote to say that he had been reading the Everyday Sexism Project and really starting to recognise what women were going through for the first time. And he was walking down the street and there were two women ahead of him and some men started shouting, get your tits out at them. And he said, I panicked, I needed to... Okay. Oh, and that was his way of, of you know, <laughs> forcing them to recognise you wouldn't do it to me. Laura, we just lost so you at the point. Don't do it to them. We just lost you at the punchline. Can you, can you say the, the man panicked and said what to the women? We don't know yet. Oh no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So these, these, these other guys were shouting, get your tits out, to the women in front of him. And he didn't know what to do, so he lifted up his T-shirt and showed them his instead. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, look. It's, it's, it, it sounds trivial, but it's little things, I think. And you it's, know. it's individual people saying, actually, I can do something about this, even if it's tiny. And I think that the... It's enough of us do that. Exactly. I, th change. I think that these individual things are part of a much, much, much bigger power structure. I hope that the talk today has left you feeling like you have a better understanding of the systems and the structures of misogyny, because with knowledge comes power, and we need to understand this stuff if we're going to fight it. And what we're talking about is not just changing the behaviour of individual boys and men, um, but about changing centuries of patriarchy, misogyny and male entitlement. And 
we can do it. I think that this festival demonstrates we can do it. I think, Laura, your work demonstrates we can do it. We can all be ladder snatchers. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for bearing with us through the technical problems. Happy All About Women, happy International Women's Day, and thank you, Laura Bates. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thanks.